Hello, everybody. Sorry I'm not here today. I'll also not be here on Tuesday, so you'll have uh, another joyous lecture for me. I'll try to keep this one short to maybe 15, 20 minutes. Um, you'll have time to work on a worksheet that will just give you some practice with uh, Chris Stoller's central place theory. It's really pretty easy. Um, it's one of the many models that demonstrates sort of a pattern that exists in a lot of places in geography, just like we learned about patterns for von Thunen's model, for example. So today you can see we're looking at patterns of urban areas. And I'll say that the patterns are, in many ways, like von Thunen's model, don't apply everywhere. They're just generalities that a geographer has noted at some point and um, you might spot in certain places. Let's get into it because I think it's just easier to explain them and um, you can figure out for yourself if you see some of these patterns somewhere. So first of all, we'll talk about rank size rule. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a relatively rare pattern uh, and it's nationwide, so on a scale of a country. I suppose you could also do it on the scale of a state um, like Illinois or something like that. But uh, in our case, we'll look at it uh, nationally. So this is most common to find in really large MDCs, which you may remember is a more developed country, and places with governments that are federal governments. You might remember there's two types of governments. There's federal governments and then there's these centralized governments. Um, so a federal government is one where you've divided up power between a central place and lots of other units of government. So in the United States where you have a federal government, our central government's in Washington DC, but they also give away power to other states in the country, and governors and things like that. So there aren't too many federal states in the world today or federal um, countries. So it's not too common to begin with. That is the rank size rule is not that common to begin with just because there aren't that many federal governments in the world. Uh, and when you narrow it down even further by saying, well, there, there also aren't, aren't many large, more developed countries, uh, you're not gonna see rank size rule too often. If a country does have um, a pattern of cities that follows the rank size rule, this can demonstrate that the country has pretty good infrastructure. They've managed to uh, get people to move to different parts of the country largely by building something that allows them to get there. Roads, railroads, airports, etc. So similarly to uh, what we learned about uh, Borchert's model, uh, when you build infrastructure somewhere, of course that allows people to travel. So that influences where people choose to live. So countries that are really developed will probably have really good infrastructure, especially if they're very large countries in terms of their land area. And if they have a federal government, that gives more incentive to build infrastructure to get to different places, just because all the power is not concentrated in one place, power can be found in different places. So not that you necessarily move somewhere thinking, oh, well, there's lots of power there, I'm going there. Um, you know, highways are really the main reason why, or access to an area via railroad or something else. But uh, it just so happens that um, federal governments do tend to attract more people to different places um, because of the power, partly. So here's how it works, and here's an example. So for your note card, you could put Germany down as an example of a country that follows the rank size rule. I haven't yet explained it. So um, if you read and uh, you have your note card, you probably already know that it follows a simple mathematical rule. Uh, the rule is if your country size is uh, X, or pardon me, if your largest city has a population of X, so let's take this example of Berlin, if their largest city has a population of 3.4 million, then the next largest city should have a population that is X divided by two. So the second largest city is the denominator in this case by which you're dividing the largest city. So 3.4 divided by two gives you the population of your second largest city. Your third largest city then should be one third the size of your largest city. So Munich, in the case of Germany, is almost one third the size of Berlin. 
If you multiply Munich's population by three, you get 3.9 million. That's larger than Berlin, so it doesn't exactly follow the rule, but technically nowhere in the world exactly follows this pattern uh, because A, it's not a rule, and B, it would be impossible for cities to exactly follow this. So uh, it's just an approximation. And you can see if we look at their fourth largest city, there's uh, 1 million people there. If this were to exactly follow the rule, their population would be about 850,000. So one quarter of 3.4 million. So this is just a rough approximation, but you can see rank size rule tells you that if the largest city has a population of X, second largest city will have a population of X divided by two, third largest city will have a population of X divided by three, fourth largest city will have a population of X divided by four, and so on. The alternative to this is a country that has a primate city. You can't have both a country that follows the rank size rule and also the primate city rule. Mathematically, it doesn't make sense according to these theories. So this one I will explain it, uh, to start out. This is where a country has a, a largest city, whatever that largest city is, where the population is more than twice that of the next largest city. And on top of that, that city that is this largest by at least double, or more than double, uh, also has some sort of political, social, or economic influence or pull. So you might be thinking, well, if a country doesn't follow the rank size rule, then it must follow the primate city rule. Not necessarily. Uh, you may have a city in a country that is way larger than the next largest city, but may not actually have that much political, social, or economic influence. We'll look at an example in a minute. An easy way to remember what the primate city means is just to remember, at least for me, a, a primate, a big gorilla. They're sort of like the dominating force in a country a lot of the time. These are most common in less developed countries and places with unitary governments. The power in a unitary government is centralized in one place. So a lot of people are attracted there because that has a big amount of pull for people that want connections to the government. There's a lot of money in those places, a lot of tax money often. Places in unitary governments, you might remember, tend to get a lot of economic investment, while places outside of the main city in the unitary government don't tend to get as much investment because, again, power is not really distributed that much. So this uh, idea of uh, unitary governments tends to lead to more primate cities uh, in less developed countries. You end up seeing a lot of primate cities in places that were once colonies. So if you uh, think of like, um, that's a good example. Uh, I guess you could say India, um, but uh, India has a lot of big cities. So I'll keep it to like, uh, Nigeria. Nigeria really has one big, very popular city, and this is how the British wanted it. They wanted to concentrate their power in one place. One last explanation for why primate cities exist ties into something we learned a long time ago about this idea called the gravity model. Gravity model is just that idea you might remember where a city has um, more pull, more gravity, it attracts more people if it's one of two things, or both. Uh, if the city has uh, a huge population already, lots of people are going to choose to go to that city for lots of reasons, some of which are explained by Chris Dollar's model, which we'll get to in a second, um, or because it is also very close to something else. So if I'm a New Yorker in New York City and I decide that I'm going to move outside of New York City, I really have two general patterns I'm going to follow according to the gravity model. I'm either going to go all the way across the country to Los Angeles because that's the next largest city, so even though it's far away, its size pulls me in. Or I might go somewhere right around New York City, somewhere else nearby, because I like being close to places I'm familiar with for whatever reason, family, friends, job, connections, etc. So the idea of uh, the gravity model applies to primate cities just because primate cities often have a lot of pull due to their size. So these patterns of urban areas can apply in um, various places, but they don't always apply. I'll, I told you I was going to show you an example of a place that may or may not apply. This is the very first slide, so I'll actually back up here because I started without a title. There we go. Same title as what you had on the last slide, so nothing to change really, nothing to write down, but this is where I meant to start. We can see we've got a picture of China here, or a map of China, and this shows us with the Korapleth map, or the colors, uh, different shades of brown, the population densities in China 
and it identifies major cities. So you've got major cities like Beijing, the capital, Tianjin, Shanghai, and so on. And I just ask a couple questions down here. First of all, does China have a primate city or does it follow the rank size rule? I told you that it doesn't have to be one or the other, it certainly can't be both, but not every country follows the rank size rule or the primate city rule. So I've given you some data here about Shanghai cities, or pardon me, China cities. Shanghai, their largest city, uh, right here on the east coast uh, center of China, 22 million. Beijing has 11 and a half. Boy, that seems like that's pretty close to rank size rule. So let's check out the third largest city. Well, it doesn't follow. If this were the rank size rule, what would the population be for Tianjin? It would be somewhere around, if that's the largest city, that's the second largest city. This would be the third largest city. So this would be about one third the population of Shanghai. So roughly one third of that would be about seven and a half million. So it's way above that. Guangzhou should be uh, way smaller than it is if it follows rank size rule, and it doesn't. So does China have then a primate city? Does it have a city that is at least double, more than double, the population of its second largest city? Uh, no. If you double 11.5 million, you've got 23 million. So Shanghai is not a primate city for the population rule. And it also doesn't have uh, the same amount of pull politically as Beijing. Beijing's the capital. So a primate city not only needs to be more than double the population of the next largest city, but it also needs to have some economic uh, and political pull, cultural pull as well. So Shanghai doesn't accomplish that, which means that China does not have a primate city or a rank size rule um, pattern. So the second question on here is just whether China uh, seems to fit Kristaller central place theory based on where these big cities are placed. So we'll get to Kristaller's theory, and then we'll come back and look at this, see if we can get an idea. So as we look at Kristaller's theory, there's not a whole lot to write down, or to grasp, I should say. His theory, like von Thunen, assumes that uh, the world is all the same. That's what an isotropic plane is. Everything is the same everywhere. Iso means equal. Uh, this is, of course, not how real life is, but you might be able to spot these patterns somewhere. In this perfect world that Kristaller envisions or draws his model on, this isotropic plane, he believes that the perfect shape for uh, this model is a hexagon because you can easily match up hexagons and leave no empty space. If instead of a hexagon he chose to uh, demonstrate his model with circles, you obviously can't make all edges of the circle or all parts of the circle match up with another circle. So uh, this leaves no wasted space. Uh, I'll explain how I think you can remember what Kristaller's theory was. If um, you can remember the name, then you should be able to remember the basics about it. But um, that explains the hexagon. And the logic behind this pattern that you see, where you've got a major urban area, medium-sized urban areas around it at all the six points of the hexagon, and then around each of those medium-sized cities, you have six more points for like smaller cities. And even around those, you've got smaller points for smaller cities. So we've got like four levels of cities here, although they've only marked A, B, and C. You do see that there would be another D there if they labeled it. So big city, medium city, smaller city, smallest city, right? Um, the idea here is that each city has its own market. So for city A, here is where their market is. It's a huge area. City B has a smaller market. City C would have uh, an even smaller, pardon me, B's market is this yellow line. Uh, A's market, I've already screwed this up, A's market is this huge red area, pardon me, B's market then would be this yellow area, a C size market would be an even smaller hexagon, of course D then, have, they haven't even drawn on here, would be way smaller. So how do they come up with these ideas, or how did Chris Dollar come up with these ideas? Well, he believed that every service or product had a few um, tenets or characteristics that would sort of help determine uh, how often it would be provided in a city. And this would sort of help determine what uh, a market might look like for a big, small, or medium-sized city or whatever. So I'm jumping ahead a bit, but if you imagine a service like um, something common like a gas station, uh, how many people do you think you need to support a gas station? For your town to have a gas station, I mean, I've been through some small towns, you can easily have a gas station with, 
I don't know, a thousand people. So that's the threshold for your town having a gas station. So if I'm asking you a question of, well, how many gas stations will city A have? This is a huge market area. I couldn't give you a number, but of course they're gonna have tons of gas stations spread through all throughout here. City B will have less in this yellow area. City C will have even less. And city D may not even have one, although I suppose it's possible they would. So that's the threshold. Um, if I give you another example, uh, like a um, an aquarium. Having an aquarium is not very common. You need a lot of people to be able to support an aquarium. So uh, Chicago has one, and we have two and a half million people, including the metropolitan statistical area. We're around nine million people, and we can only still support one aquarium. Maybe if we doubled our population, we'd get a second aquarium. I have no idea. The other characteristic then for these services is how far will people travel to go and experience it or get access to it? This is the range. So in the case of like Chicago's Shed Aquarium, would you drive 30 miles? Do you, or do you think there are people who would drive 30 miles to get to the Shed Aquarium? For sure, people drive way farther than that to get to the Shed Aquarium. I remember years ago, I learned that the Ikea that's in Schaumburg attracts people from as far away as Nebraska in Kansas. People take buses to get to the Ikea in Schaumburg. Wow, what an exciting road trip that would be. So some services have a huge range and a huge threshold. Some may have a huge range and a low threshold. Um, so for example, a Ferrari dealership, this is an example I'll get to in a second, but a Ferrari dealership uh, may have a very small people that will support it because they're incredibly rich. You don't need to sell a lot of Ferraris in order to stay in business. Um, and they're not that common. So people may drive a long, long distance, have a huge range to go get to a Ferrari dealership. So an example that I just mentioned, the Ferrari dealership, which would have a higher threshold, a grocery store, or a Ferrari dealership. I'm basically asking you which one has a larger re uh, population required to support it. A Ferrari dealership uh, would seem to have a pretty low threshold. In fact, I just sort of described to you that um, it would it would only require a few people. So I guess I should backtrack because I've already um, gotten this backwards in my head. This is not going to help you at all. If you imagine a small town, like a thousand people, would they have a Ferrari dealership? The answer is probably not because the chances of people in that town having uh, enough money for a Ferrari are pretty slim. Even if they did have a lot of money, there aren't going to be that many people who are going to want to buy a Ferrari. So where are you going to find a Ferrari? In a small town or in Chicago? You're going to find a Ferrari dealership in Chicago. There's way more rich people in Chicago. So think of the threshold as the, the number of people that are in an average population to support a service as your threshold. Chicago's got an average population in many ways. We have certainly a lot of rich people. Um, and that helps make it possible for a Ferrari dealership to exist. So maybe if I had to think back on a different example for something that has a high range, low threshold, I'd, I'd have to think back uh, and come up with something else. We'll see if I can. I've already screwed it up once. Don't hold it against me. Uh, as for the grocery store, so to answer this question, a higher threshold would apply for the Ferrari dealership because as I've said, very few people need Ferraris. So you'd have uh, need to have a lot of people in order to find enough customers to make a Ferrari dealership likely, whereas everyone needs food. So grocery stores don't require a huge threshold. Um, the one that would have the higher range, I've already explained, that one I got correct. Uh, you'd have a, a Ferrari dealership uh, very far away. People would be happy to come a long distance because a Ferrari is so special, whereas I don't know if anybody's driven more than maybe 50 miles to get to a grocery store. Uh, hopefully you're not driving anywhere close to that. So here's the easy way that I think you can remember Christoller's theory and just the basics of what it's about. I've given you all these clues throughout the year, memory cues to help you remember things like von Thunen's model, my Thunen farms gather round, or um, for the UN Convention, the Law of the Sea, uh, unclose, you've got the coast extends horizontally. Uh, this is not an acronym. This is just simply taking part of his name. In his name, you can see the word crystal, basically, and crystals are usually hexagons, like that crystal. So if you can remember that they are usually hexagons, then you are 
going to probably remember that Christoller's theory is this model of cities and their surrounding smaller cities. The last fun fact I just put up there, uh, you ha would have no reason to write down. Um, Christoller seems like an innocent guy. Uh, he worked for the Nazis. Oh, great. Uh, he helped plan Germany's land use during World War II. Uh, worked for a guy who was high up in the Nazis named Heinrich Himmler to try and plan how Germany's land would be settled after they conquered stuff. So, uh, not that we have time to get into it and you're probably not interested, but geography has a long history with uh, connections to government and militaries. Um, so that's just one fun, weird example. No way will you need to know that for the AP test. As I mentioned, you've got a worksheet to check out um, to give practice for Christoller's central place theory. I'll just go back one last slide to the very beginning to see if China seems to fit Chris Dollar's central place theory. So where's their biggest city? We said it's Shanghai. Well, it's certainly in the middle of their coast here. So in some ways, it seems to apply. We can't assume that China is isotropic. We you know we've got a desert here and a desert here, and mountains here. So it's not all the same everywhere. There's coasts and rivers in different places. But where's their next biggest city? Well, Beijing is up there. Is it about the same distance from Tianjin? No. Tianjin is right next to it. So that in no way seems to follow much of Christoller's theory, but Guangzhou is down there. That's almost the exact same distance between those two. So there seems to be some consistency here. They're almost the exact same size. So there's some truth to uh, Christoller's theory. And uh, then when you consider maybe some of the geographic features, maybe it makes sense to have Tianjin a similar size. Highly doubt it, but you get the general gist, hopefully, of how you can analyze this stuff. Uh, all right, I'll end it here. Practice on that worksheet. Talk to people around you as you're working on it or when you're done, see if your answers are the same. And we'll go over it next, next class since I'm not here tomorrow. Bye.